Good afternoon, Village Community Church. It is certainly wonderful to be with you this Sunday. And um, I thank God for everyone that is here. And I hope everyone had a wonderful, wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Before we get started, um, I will go ahead and read um, our scripture reference that was already read by our deacon. I will be reading it in the new revised um, standard um, version. And this is 2 Peter um, chapter 3, verse 14 to 18. Again, I'm reading again, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 to 18 in the new revised standard version. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of, his, uh, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. Some are, there are some, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do other scriptures. 17, you therefore, beloved, since you were forewarned before, beware that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless and lose your own stability, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you for this Sunday. Lord, I want to thank you for this time to come together again with family and to proclaim your word. Lord, I ask that you be with me, Lord, as I minister your word to your people. Lord, I ask that you minimize my nerves. I, Lord, I ask that you minimize my own emotions, dear God, and let your power be shown through me. Lord, I pray for each and every household who is hearing this word. Lord, I ask that you give them an extra blessing, Lord. Lord, I ask that you remove all distraction that might be pulling on them and pulling them away. And Lord, I ask that your word come through powerful to transform lives, Lord, and to bring light into the dark places in this world. Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this opportunity. I thank you, my fellow clergy and the pastor for all their support and love in your name. Amen. So on Thanksgiving Day, I got to do something that I had not done in a very long time. I sat and watched most, not all, of an NFL game. And if many of you know Scott, I think you guys know which game the Twyman household sat and watched. As I was sitting there watching the game, I realized that as I got older, I lacked the patience and with school, I just lacked the time to watch any sporting events or any shows that I enjoy watching. So while I was watching this game with Scott, it reminded me of some other sporting events that I had missed watching due to not having the time. And one of those sporting events are relay races. I love watching relay races. And then I realized with the postponement of the Olympics this year that I haven't even got to see the relay races on the Olympic scene. I love watching relay races because I enjoy watching the people as they are approaching the final leg of their race and they pass the baton to their teammate. I love watching the anticipation of the runner as they stand in place and they take their position. And as the, when the baton is passed to them, they secure it in their hands and they turn and they run with all that they have. They place their focus forward and they take off to run their leg of the race. And that the team that is most successful in the relay are those that are able to pass the baton and run their leg of the race. That's the team that's victorious. 
The team that do not pass the baton correctly or those that use deceptive methods to run the race are usually those that don't get to finish the race. So my focus today, once I remembered my love for relays, my focus today on passing the baton is not merely to discuss my love for relay races. My focus today is to help illustrate the conclusion of this powerful letter that we have been studying in 2 Peter. See, we know that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, which has already been read to you by myself as well as our deacon, that part of the letter is characterized as the final exhortation or the doxology. This is where Peter is closing out his second letter to the churches. And Peter is giving his final remarks as he's sensing that his death is near in sight. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 14, since I know that my death will come soon, as indeed the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, verse 15 says, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you will be able at any time to recall these things. See, Peter understands that he's finishing up his journey. Peter understands that his leg of the race is coming to an end and he is preparing to spiritually pass the baton. But before this, he is providing some instructions that will be vital for those who were left, those who were continuing in their leg of the race, those who were continuing to spiritually grow and train as they continue to run this journey out of Christian faith. So the title of today's sermon is, The Baton Has Been Passed. Are you moving forward with your leg of the race? The baton has been passed. Are you moving forward with your leg of the race? First, if you will bear with me this morning, I want to recap the letter of 2 Peter that our ministers have taken us through so far this month. 2 Peter starts out with some qualities that believers must possess. These qualities, church, is what makes us victorious even as we start in the race. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says, For this reason, you must make every effort to support your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge and knowledge self-control and self-control endurance and endurance with godliness and godliness with mutual affection and mutual affection with love. Verse eight tells us, for these things are yours and are increasing, for if these things are yours and increasing among you, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. These qualities are vital to our progress. They keep us effective and they keep us going. They keep us productive as we are growing in our knowledge and we are progressing towards our final victory in Christ. Every athlete that takes the field to run, there are some vital instruments, there are some vital items that they keep on them at all times. They keep them in their bag so that they are at close reach for when they need to pull them out and use them. I believe that as Christians, these qualities serve us in the very same way. And we should never be without them. We should never run out of them. And we should never run low of them. Because see, it is these qualities that help us to get in shape and stay in shape. It is these qualities that allow us to sweat off and to burn off those sinful habits that we have in our lives that tend to weigh us down and to keep us from fully growing in Christ. If you forget your self-control, you can't run this race for Christ. 
If you forget your endurance, you will be falling apart at the finish line. And oh my God, if you forget your godliness, you can't even take your lane because you are ill-equipped. Church, it is these vital characteristics that we need as we grow and run our race for Christ. Next, then we talk about our track. Peter shows us the firm foundation that we run on. It is God's authoritative message to us. The scriptures are dependable, they are reliable, and they hold up no matter what is placed upon them. Second Peter chapter one, verse 21 says, because no prophecy has ever came by human will, but by men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, meaning that the foundation that we run on, the foundation that we step on, it is firm and it is true. It will never give out from under us. It will never cause us to buckle at the knees. This is no false or made up turf that we run on. This is the real reliable word of Christ. The scriptures provide us our path, where we should run and how we should run. As stated in our Bible study in Psalms, in Psalm chapter one, in Psalms one, sorry, it says that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the way of scoffers, but the delight, his delight is the law of the Lord. And on this law, he meditates day and night. On this law is where we step, where we take our runs, where we take our position. See, in God's word, we find our path and we find our mission. It is in this world that word that we find the lane that we've been assigned. It is in scripture. Our steps are secured as we firmly plant ourselves in the knowledge of God. Then as you go through the scriptures, week three, we see that Peter tells us who not to run with. Everybody in this race is not our teammate. Peter says that we don't run with the false teachers. Peter say that many will follow these false teachers sensual sensuality and the way to the truth will be blasphemed. There will be those that will attempt to distract you and to move you out of your lane that God is planting you in. They will attempt to use other methods of passing information, which is not the truth. It is false. And this is why it is important that we remain planted with like-minded teammates fir firmly walking together in God's word in the lane that God has called us to. These false teachers might appear to be winning the race. These false teachers might look like they have better equipment than we have. However, church, second Peter tells us they will not finish the race victoriously. They will not be in the winner's circle when it's time to celebrate. Don't be swayed. Don't leave your lane. Everyone in the race is not your teammate. And then we go on to learn, last week we learned, why do we run this race? Why must we be in this race in the first place? And it shows us that we must keep our eyes on finishing victorious because there's a prize at the end of the race. We run because we know that at the end, is the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter says that the Lord is not slow about his promise. As some think of slowness, this is not the way we should think of slowness, not the way God thinks of it, but is patient with us and not wanting any to perish. So what may actually feel like a delay in this race being completed 
I believe that this is the podium being set. And this is the podium being expanded because there's room for all those to come into a knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is to bring salvation to as many and many more. So don't take impatience for the end to come or God's returning as a failure of God, but look at it as his grace, as he's opening up his arms and his salvation for many more to receive it. So now that we've walked through where we've gotten to Second Peter, now we end up at today's scripture. We end up at, at Peter's final exhortation. And like Peter, when he was writing to those in the original letter, well, church, I believe the message is the same for us today. We, each and every one of us, have been passed a baton. We have been passed a baton to run a leg of this race. Our spiritual lives represent a leg of this race that has been assigned for each and every one of us to run. I understand this can be frightening because when somebody is passed a baton, it is a great responsibility that you hold in your hand. Some people might want to run from the baton. But the beauty of the racer is they know the baton is coming and they stand poised, ready to receive the baton. They stand poised, ready to receive this great responsibility. And we as members of this church, of the universal church of God, have received this duty. This great responsibility has been placed on each and every one of us. So first we must acknowledge that we are part of a team. This is not a solo race. We have been pulled together as part of a team. So as you see in chapter three of first Peter, Peter begins to refer to those he's talking to as beloved. Some versions may even say, dear friends. Now, if you guys remember when we started the first letter of Peter in 1 Peter chapter one, when he opened his letter, 1 Peter opened up his letter saying to the exiles and he listed the churches who had been chosen and destined by the father. But now as we getting on to the end of this letter and Peter's beginning to pass the baton, he says, beloved. Some versions again, dear friends. In the passage that I read today, if you go back and look from 14 to 18, the word beloved is used by Peter three times in this text. I believe that Peter is communicating a significance and a closeness that we as a team, as team members and co-laborers for Christ must possess as we grow in Christ and run our race. Beloved communicates a special close relationship. We see beloved was used by God towards Jesus after Jesus's baptism and the Holy Spirit depending, descended upon him and God sent the Holy Spirit came down like a dove and descend, descended on him. And God from heaven spoke and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am pleased. Like Peter, we must acknowledge those that we are in community with, those that we served with, as in the body of Christ, we are each other's beloved brothers and sisters. We may be scattered in our individual homes. We may be scattered outside of the building with which we meet with, but church, we belong together. We have been connected. We have been sealed together by the blood of Christ and we are beloved each other's brothers and sisters. 
We need to let each other know that they are a valued part of the team. We need to let each other know that they are significant to the body of Christ. Church, the world has plenty of hate. The world has plenty of discrimination. The world has plenty of division. The world has plenty of strife. The world separates us into race, social economic status by zip code. But in the body of Christ, we are connected and we should be treated as beloved amongst each other. We should not only hear the love, but we should feel the love. COVID-19, Thanksgiving, and other celebrations of 2020 may have left many of us feeling isolated and feeling alone. But we must acknowledge those around us and communicate the togetherness even in this time of separation. Even when we're not physically together, church, we are connected together. Our presence together in the body of Christ is important. And we as a team are connected by the blood of Christ. And in order that we might grow together in him, we must do this together as a team. So let us always, always let each and every one of us know that you are significant, you are valued, and you are loved. We do not run this race alone. Even when you feel alone, there's a team that is holding you up and standing there with you. Next, verse 14 says, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish. As Christians, our efforts should be a representation of Christ. These characteristics that are listed in this verse, at peace, without spot, without blemish, these are things used to describe Christ. These are traits used to describe Christ as our ultimate sacrifice. So if you go back to the baton analogy, my favorite part, when the runner receives the baton, it is placed in the palm of their hands and they hold on to it so firmly. Their grip onto this thing, their hand then begins to form in the shape of the baton as they hold on to it. And they hold that thing so tightly, it's imprinted in their hand, their hand forms it and they run and they hold it no matter what. Well, I believe as believers, we have the same responsibility. We must hold firmly to what has been placed inside of us. And that is the Holy Spirit. We must maintain a grip on all that has been put inside of us through Jesus Christ. As we grow and we strive, we should then begin to take the shape of what we are holding on to and what has been placed inside of us so that at the return of Christ, we have now been formed and imprinted with what has been put inside of us. And this is how Peter can write to be found at peace without blemish or spot. Because once you grip on to what God has put in your heart, there's nothing left but for the outside to begin to respond in kind to what you've been put on the inside. What God has placed within us equips us and it nourishes us with what we need to grow. This is why Christ tells us uh, to abide in me as I abide in you. It is because that once we abide in Christ and Christ's spirit is abiding in us, that we will begin to take hold and take form to what has been placed within us. Even in these difficult times, church, we can live lives that resemble Christ and his spirit working within us. I think we heard it in our testimony today. If we, like the runner, 
will hold firmly to what's been placed within us, then no matter how hot we get, no matter how uncomfortable we tend to get, no matter how lonely this time may be or how daunting or how sad things might appear, we will see God shaping, God's shape being taken within us. We will see ourselves being molded in the likeness of Christ. And that is only achieved because we hold on to what's been placed within us. Verse 17 then says, therefore, beloved, since you were forewarned, be aware that you are not carried away with the era of lawlessness and lose your own stability, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, holding firm to what's been placed within us, we will keep those false teachers at bay who will try to twist and misapply God's word, the word that's been planted within us. They will try to get us to loosen our grip. We are experiencing times right now, church, where God's word is being used to cause confusion and it's being used to justify actions and behaviors that God never intended it. And see, there are people out there who are twisting and distorting God's word. But Peter is very clear, this will lead to destruction. Don't go down that lane because it will lead to destruction. We as believers, we are handed this baton and, and with it comes great responsibility to speak the truth of what we hold on to. With this comes great responsibility that even when the scriptures become difficult to understand, we get in God's word and we allow the Holy Spirit to work it through us because what we hold on to is will either save lives and keep others from perishing. So Peter says that in this responsibility, we need to spread God's truth. And in his final word, we must grow in grace. We must grow in grace. We got to keep our focus and our eyes on what's before us. Keep our eyes on our final victory in Christ. We must be alert and running on our faith in Jesus Christ, walking in the way of God that's found in the scriptures and God's spirit that's been placed within us. Make no mistake, we live in a world of sin and we have an opponent whose goal is to overtake us, to maybe lap us around the track a couple times and make us feel discouraged. We have an opponent that would even try to pull us off of our lane and pull us on his team. But Peter shows us that as he's beginning to pass the baton in his final word, he says that we have been equipped through Christ but don't stop there. Now it is time to grow. Continue to grow in grace. So in closing, I hope you guys enjoyed my relay analogies. I've never run a relay race in my life. But in closing, the beauty of running relays, church, my absolute favorite part, this is the part that usually has me up on my feet jumping is that every relay race has an anchor runner. And in the race, the anchor runner is the one who is his goal to finish the race. The role of the anchor runner when he steps on that field is he is either gonna make up the lead that's been lost by his teammates, or he's going to maintain the lead that's been gained by his teammates and he's gonna bring in the team victoriously. The anchor I've learned, cause I've never been one, is the fastest, 
most experienced person on that team. So they are saved until the last leg of the race. They don't bring them out too soon. They save them until the very end of the race. Church, in our spiritual journey, we too have an anchor. We have the most effective, most experienced, and the greatest anchor in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We learn in John chapter one, verse one, that he started the race when they said that in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the, wor and the word was with God and the word was God. Our anchor started the race. And just as we see in the book of Revelation, our anchor will finish the race and he will make up whatever lost ground there may be, and he will finish the race in victory, church. So if relay runners, they look forward and they progress with what's been placed within them. Church, we as the spiritual runners, we have to run our race looking forward to the hope and the expectation looking forward to not what's been placed within our hands, but what's been placed within our hearts. That's what we hold on to when we run. And the funny thing about it is we've been passed the baton to a race that's already been won. Our race has been won. So then you might want to ask, well, if the race has been won, why am I in the race? The reason, because again, our forerunner has run the race, finished the race, and he will return to anchor the race and bring it on in, all for God's glory. So why then is God looking for me to run the race? Because just like with God, he is not like the world. God is not focused on our speed. God is not looking at how swiftly we can run our leg of the race. God is looking for our willingness to take what's been placed inside of us, what's been placed within our hearts and to move and to grow spiritually. See, running this race and growing is not achieved by being a spectator. Instead, we grow with every step we take in faith. Every step that we take in faith, not speed, is how we run this race, how we grow in grace, and how we finish this race. Even in the difficult times, church, when you don't even want to lace up your shoes, keep pushing. Hold firmly to what has been placed within you. Hold firmly onto those who have come and run before you. Abide in God's word and recall what has been placed within your heart that will shape you into the image of Christ. So village, let us then focus on Hebrews 12, 1, as we go out in praise. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings to us closely and let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. I know 2020 has been rough. I know there's been a lot of disappointment. I know things are in turmoil, but God has placed you in a lane. Take your stance. You got the baton. Hold on to what's been placed inside you and run the race that's been set before you. Thank you, church, and have a wonderful week.